following up on last week's uh, Windows atom bomb to, with the details, <laughs> there's there's a company in Silo uh, who has a, a team leader, uh, Tal Lieberman, who did a beautiful bit of creative engineering. Um, atom bombing, as he called it, is performed only by using long-established features of every Windows operating system. There's no need to exploit an operating system bug or any vulnerabilities in an application. So there's nothing to patch. Microsoft cannot, at this point, significantly change or remove these features because all the apps, I mean, like, you know, in the ecosystem of Windows, depend upon them. Um, however, it is the case, I, I'll put in a caveat, that anti-malware, including Microsoft's native AV, will likely quickly adopt some augmented heuristics in an effort to detect the use of the technique that Tal has developed. So, okay, so he called it atom bombing because this uses something known as the Windows Global Atom Table. And it's, a, it's one of these features that Microsoft put in in 1.0. It's always been there. And it's not really clear what Microsoft was thinking. You can have local atom tables or there is a global atom table. What, what, and what all that means is it is essentially, you can think of it as a user definable dictionary that is you can you, you can give windows a blob a string typically to hold and it gives you back a token by which and, and that's called an atom uh and then you refer to that in the future with this token so you so there's one call an api call where you say Here's a, a null terminated string buffer. Uh, insert this in the global atom table and give me back the token. And so Windows gives you a little a little 32-bit widget. Just, just a, it's like a cookie. And then in the future, you can re, you can have Windows look up for you that original string with the cookie. So it's just sort of like a, a dictionary. Um, applications can do can use it locally for their own like private dictionary or as I said there is a as a universally globally defined atom table that Microsoft must have thought was useful for something I'm not sure why or how it's used but you know if there was a system that had multiple processes, then this would be a means of doing inter-process communications, uh, allowing one process to establish atoms that were accessible by another. But as we know, from a security standpoint, this is breaking process isolation boundaries by definition. That is, it's, it's inherently a concern. I, I would argue it's inherently insecure, not by itself, but when leveraged with other exploits. So uh, what uh, what Tal did was uh, he, as, as, as he describes it in his own write-up, he just sort of sat down and went through the API looking for problems. And he ran across global atoms. And he thought, huh, uh, that's interesting. Because... Okay, what normally happens with a buffer overrun, as we, we know that a buffer overrun exists when an application accepts attacker-controlled data and it, it is somehow overruns the buffer. Sometimes they can be made self-executing, but in this world of data execution protection or prevention, uh, many times the data is not the data's area where the data buffer would be is non-executable. So some tweaking has to happen. The that that segment of data needs to be made executable. And so for that, 
the attackers use so-called return-oriented programming, which we've been talking about in the context recently of address space layout randomization that makes ROP more difficult, but as we know, unfortunately not as impossible as the designers would like. So the idea is that with return-oriented programming, you are jumping to known executable code to get little bits of work done just by jumping to the end of a subroutine uh, that, that already exists in some code that is executable, like in the kernel, for example, and then it returns to you after finishing the subroutine. But you just use the last few instructions to get some work done on your behalf. And by stringing a few of those together, you can create a result. It's difficult to to build a whole malware exploit out of little snippets. But the idea is you can get it to do things like flip the non-execute bit for you, which then makes the buffer overrun code ex executable, and then you jump to it and it runs. So, so again, a hybrid attack. What, so what, what Tal worked out were all the details of using the global, okay, but what I should say is that the starting point for that is a buffer overrun. That is the way the attacker gets their data in an innocent victim process space is a flaw in that code, in a web server, for example, where some crazy response is made to a, to a, to a query and the buffer wasn't big enough to hold it, and it ends up, you know, the attacker's response ends up sitting in data that, that is the way the attacker gets the data in. What's, what's haunting about the, the global atom table is this is a non-defective means. That is, this is a officially sanctioned way of getting one process to, to have its data inserted into another. So what, what Tal realized was that the global atom table created a, a break in process isolation. So he created, and his, his, it's on GitHub, by the way, all open source, all documented for anyone who wants to play. He created a, again, because it's not based on any defects. It's a problem with Windows. He, he created a, a small uh, return-oriented programming script, which, so, so his, his, his application, his, his attacking application, first, uh, stores the executable code in a global atom. It says to Windows, here's a string. Uh, it needs not to have any nulls in it, so it's got to be a little tricky because a null terminates a string. So it's got to be a, a chunk of code with no zeros somehow. Uh, that would be a bit of a challenge too. But anyway, so he did that. Now, it, now his code has been accepted by Windows and is sitting in the OS. He then strung together a short chain of re return-oriented programming snippets that caused, oh, and which he injects and caused a victim application to run. And he gives a bunch of examples. Uh, the uh, and they're again, they're just they happen to work. Uh, so, for example, uh, the VLAN program, uh, video LAN. Uh, was exploitable and paint was exploitable. He just used those as, as examples. No, due to no flaw in them, but just the fact that he was able to get his little reverse oriented, the, the return oriented programming to, to run in that process to request the global atom that he had loaded into the OS, which then transferred it into the process. He then copied it into a read-write-execute buffer and ran it and pulled it off. And so th this was really interesting because, as I said, normally you, you need to start with a flaw in the – you're exploiting a flaw in the victim process. Here, any qualified – there are some qualifications required, but any qualifying Windows process can be the victim 
of this attack. It is it is local. That is, you need an attacker in the same OS that is an attacking process. So it's not remotely exploitable directly. It does need somebody. You know, you need you need to have a, a malicious app available to then exploit across process. But anyway, beautiful piece of work, Tal. So congratulations. And as I said, Microsoft can't fix this. They, they He only used officially sanctioned, highly used APIs. So the only solution would be for malware, unfortunately, to become increasingly heuristic. To, for example, hook these different APIs and and try to detect the malicious use of the global atom table for this purpose and then prevent that from happening. So, you know, it's not what we would prefer to have, but thanks to his work, uh, a potential exploit has been found and killed. <laughs>